We have had a great time studying out of the book of Exodus. We are seeing some amazing things that we haven't seen before or even realized. And I get excited every time the Spirit of God shows me something that I never saw or even considered. And even the best of us, we began our journey in learning how being responsible to the things of God is vital as well as being accountable to Him and those He has called us to serve. Part one of this series started out with us learning about Moses and how God, in the form of a burning bush, told him to return to Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. We found that after making excuse after excuse, God appoints Aaron to accompany him in executing this extraordinary task. In this episode, we will take a bird's eye view and look at how Moses and Aaron went about obeying God and how they were at times reluctant to do what God told them to do and sometimes even fell short altogether. We will also see how each of them gave in to pride, anger, frustration, and even into compromise right here on Word on the Street with JP. Don't you touch that dial. Hey, there you are, family, and welcome to another episode of Word on the Street with JP. I'm your host, JP, and today is June the 26th, 2022. Today, I begin this study with a recap of part one of Even the Best of Us, a study in the book of Exodus. Before we get into the lesson, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we come to you as humbly as we know how to say thank you. So thank you for all of your many benefits that you have afforded us and that you have kept us safe in such an unstable world. Thank you that we can have visitation with you through your word and that we can study your very heart in relative safety. We ask that you bless those who have lost loved ones through these trying times and those who have been displaced or even injured in the conflict that rages in the Ukraine. We ask that you would be with the fighting men of not only Ukraine, but those of Russia as well, and that all that is happening is happening to bring prophecy to fulfillment to your glory. We say a special prayer for the nation of Israel and the city of Jerusalem, that they may come to know the peace that can only be found in the Messiah, Jesus. Thank you that you guard over our lives and over our affairs that we may be obedient to your will and your way. Now give us a word that is rightly divided in due season, that not only would be a blessing to all of those who hear it, but to your glory. We pray these things in the mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Okay, so we talked about Moses and how he was commissioned to set out on a journey to Egypt to convince the Pharaoh to let God's people go. God knew that Pharaoh wouldn't relent, so God subjects Egypt to the 10 plagues and Pharaoh finally gives in. Moses exits Egypt with the whole Hebrew population, which was estimated to be between 600,000 and 3 million souls. That's a lot of people to lead. And even though Moses was reluctant to fulfill the will of God, God showed his amazing power in executing judgment on the Egyptians with the 10 plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, and the annihilation of Pharaoh's army, not to mention the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. Moses seemed to be building in his faith as well as in his relationship with God as things went along. And while Moses was getting closer to God, 
Aaron seemed to be steeped in compromise as he gives in to the people's request to build an idol, an idol which was a golden calf that they thought would lead them into the land that only God had promised them. The fault with that is that the people were void of faith because when Moses was summoned to the top of the mountain to talk to God, they thought that he was gone too long and they began to get uncomfortable. They began to panic and began to complain to Aaron that they didn't think that Moses would return. They began to cast blame at Moses, saying that he has led us out here into the wilderness to die. They asked Aaron to make them idols and Aaron didn't resist. Now Aaron was their high priest and should have stood up for the things of God as he had witnessed God's amazing power, not only while they were in Egypt, but all throughout the Exodus as well. He even initiated the build of this idol by telling them what to do to make it happen. The most egregious thing about this is that Aaron fashioned it for the people. He even made an altar for it and offered burnt offerings before it and claimed that the offerings were for God and led the people in worship. What really got me was in verse 24, Aaron denied blame by saying, when I cast it into the fire and there came out this calf, <laughs> he conveniently left out the part in verse four where it says, and he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. So you see where Aaron is slipping in his leadership already. And so at this, God is super mad and wants to kill everybody. But Moses talks him out of it by reminding him of his promise that he made to the people. Then Moses returns, sees the people partying like it's 1999 and gets so mad that he throws the commandments down, breaking them, then destroyed the golden calf. Then Aaron blames his compromise on the people. In anger, Moses commands the Levites to kill those who are not on God's side. So they did kill about 3,000 men that day. Moses goes back up the mountain and gets God to rewrite the law. And God tells Moses to continue the journey, but that he wouldn't be with them. Instead, he would send the angel of the Lord because God didn't want to be in the midst of the people because of what they did. And because of this, Moses takes the tabernacle out of the camp and sets it outside of the camp. God talked with Moses there, and because Moses showed his allegiance, he finds favor in God's sight. To the point that when Moses asked if he could see God face to face, God showed him his glory as he passed by, all but his face. So in today's episode, we'll see the perfect example of having and cultivating a relationship with God. We will also see the divinity and mercy of of God as he uses an intermediary to deal with his sinful people. Doesn't that sound familiar? This relationship between God and Moses is a type of what God would bring to pass and was perfected through his only son, Jesus, the infallible son of God who sacrificed his life in order to deliver us all out of bondage of this world. So here we'll pick up the continuation of part one of Even the Best of Us in chapter 34, and it reads, And the Lord said unto Moses, Hew thee two tablets of stone like unto the first, and I will write upon these tablets the words that were in the first tablet, which thou breakest. And be ready in the morning, and come up in the morning unto Mount Sinai, and present thyself there to me in the top of the mountain. And no man shall come up with thee, neither let any man be seen throughout all the mount, neither let the flocks nor herds feed before that mount. Verse 4, And he hewed two tablets of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning, and went up unto Mount Sinai, as the Lord had commanded him, and took in his hand the two tablets of stone. Verse 5, And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him there and proclaimed the name of the Lord. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed the Lord. 
the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and upon the children's children unto the third and the fourth generation. So we see here that Moses must go through the process of going back up the mountain and have God to write the law all over again. He tells Moses to clear the mountain, not only of men, but also of all animals. God holds nothing back as he assures Moses that the people will be judged, even though he is merciful, gracious, and patient. He stresses that those who are found guilty past this point will be the cause of their own judgment, and that judgment will be carried down through four of their generations, so they better get their act together. I would venture to say that God wasn't mad anymore, but he was very disappointed, and being the God of justice, this had to be. What God was doing was holding Moses responsible and accountable for how the people conducted themselves going further. This was actually an act of mercy that God would give them the second chance in the issuing of a warning to that effect. So we'll resume at verse 8. And Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshipped. And he said, If now I have found grace in thy sight, O Lord, let my Lord, I pray thee, go among us, for it is a stiff-necked people, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us for thine inheritance. Verse 10, And he said, Behold, I make a covenant. Before all thy people I will do marvels, such as have not been done in all the earth, nor in any nation, and all the people which thou art shall see the work of the Lord. For it is a terrible thing that I will do with thee. Verse 11, Observe thou that which I command thee this day. Behold, I drive out before thee the Amorite and the Canaanite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Hivite and the Jebusite. So when Moses heard the warning, he was quick to bow down, wasn't he? He was reminded by God of who God is. Moses obviously got the memo and immediately recognizes the holiness of God as the first thing he does is bow down in humility. Is this the same Moses that had to be told to do this in chapter 3, verse 5? As the scripture makes no inference of Moses ever changing his position as he remained bowed down before the Lord. He's gaining a reverence for God and recognizes God's holiness. In a position of worship, Moses continues to ask God to spare the people in spite of their stubborn hearts. God tells him that he is not one to break the covenant he made with the people and begins to tell him all the things that he will do to make the promises he made to the people come to pass. He told Moses to make sure that he takes in account all the people that God is going to displace to give the people the land that he promised them. We continue on in verse 12 where it says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. Verse 13, But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. Verse 14, for thou shalt worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. Verse 15, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, and they go a-whoring after their gods, and do sacrifice unto their gods, and one call thee, and thou eat of his sacrifice. Verse 16, and thou take of their daughters unto thy sons, and their daughters go a-whoring after their gods and make thy sons go a-whoring after their gods. Verse 17, Thou shalt make thee no molten gods. Verse 18, The feast of unleavened bread shalt thou keep. Seven days thou shalt eat unleavened bread, as I commanded thee, in the time of the month Abib. For in the month Abib thou camest out from Egypt. Verse 19, All that opens the matrix is mine, 
and every firstling among thy cattle, whether ox or sheep, that is male. Verse 20, but the firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb. And if thou redeem him not, then shalt thou break his neck. All the firstborn of thy sons thou shalt redeem. And none shall appear before me empty. Verse 21, six days shalt thou work, but on the seventh day thou shalt rest. In earing time and in harvest thou shalt rest. Verse 22, and thou shalt observe the feast of weeks of the first fruits of wheat harvest and the feast of ingathering at the year's end. Verse 23, thrice in the year shall all your men children appear before the Lord God, the God of Israel. 24, for I will cast out the nations before thee and enlarge thy borders. Neither shall any man desire thy land when thou shalt go up to appear before the Lord thy God thrice in the year. Verse 25, thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leaven, neither shall the sacrifice of the feast of the Passover be left unto the morning. Verse 26, the first of the first fruits of thy land thou shalt bring unto the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not seethe a kid in his mother's milk. Verse 27, and the Lord said unto Moses, write thou these words for after the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with thee and with Israel. So God has told these people what he's going to do and what their responsibility is in the covenant that he has just made with them. So, But God warns that they would encounter a lot of people that will want to hook up with the children of Israel on the way. He warns them not to connect with them in any way or make any covenants with them because they will infiltrate and lead them right back into idolatry. He warns them not to let there be any romantic relationships or casual relationships outside of the faith and to make sure that they remember what God did for them when he released them out of Egyptian captivity. To prove that they remember and that are grateful, they are to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread and to continue to make the necessary sacrifices. It seems that God is very adamant about them not connecting with the people that he's going to drive out of the land that he is going to give them. God warns Moses of this, and it's a very staunch warning. So let's keep it going at verse 28. And he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, and he did neither eat bread nor drink water, and he wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Verse 29, And it came to pass when Moses came down from the Mount Sinai with the two tables of testimony in Moses' hand. When he came down from the Mount, that Moses was not that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. Verse 30, And when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Verse 31, And Moses called unto them, and Aaron and all the rulers of the congregation returned unto him, and Moses talked with them. Verse 32, And afterward all the children of Israel came nigh, and he gave them in commandment all that the Lord had spoken with him in Mount Sinai. Verse 33, Until Moses had done speaking with them, he put a veil on his face. Verse 34, but when Moses went in before the Lord to speak with him, he took the veil off until he came out. Wow, so we see a transition here. We see that, number one, it took Moses and God 40 days and 40 nights to come up with the renewed tables that the law was written on. Man, it don't take nothing 40 days and 40 nights. But I guess that they were enjoying each other as Moses spent that time alone with God. This is a type of Jesus as this is the amount of time Jesus spent in the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Neither Jesus nor Moses ate or drank anything during their time in the wilderness. Jesus being tempted and Moses spending that time in the presence of God. I believe that they were working on their relationship and we can certainly see the transformation of Moses' attitude and faith in God. They spent a lot of time together as Moses had found favor 
in the sight of God. I also notice that the first tablets that the law were written on were written on by God himself. And that's the case in regards to the second visitation with God. But God had already pre-written them before Moses came up the mountain. When Moses finally surfaced, he wore a badge of honor all over his face as the text says that Moses was unaware that his face was exposed to the glory of God while he was in his presence. And because of this, God's glory had been transferred onto his face as evidence that he had been in the very presence of the one and only true and living God. Can you imagine being in the presence of God? And because Moses was getting with God's program, he allowed him to spend that amount of time with him. And when Moses come down the mountain and talked to the people, he warned the people of the terrible things that God had planned for those who remained stiff-necked. We we'll continue in verse 34. And he came out and spake unto the children of Israel that which he was commanded. Verse 35. And the children of Israel saw the face of Moses, that the skin of Moses' face shone. That means it was shining. And Moses put the veil upon his face again until he went in to speak with him. So this was an amazing thing that just by being in the presence of God, it made an outward appearance evidence of their relationship. And so not much has changed. Even today, people can tell when we have been in the presence of God. Just like they could tell that Moses had been in the presence of God by the shine that was on his face, the glory of God was exuding from his skin. And some even today become afraid and even intimidated by us, just like the people became afraid of Moses when God's glory shone upon his face. We don't realize that the same glory of God that was manifested in the face of Moses happens in the lives of those who spend time in the presence of God in today's generation, but for those who have loved for him only. God's glory is manifested in a different way, though. It is manifested by our joy. It is manifested in our peace. It is manifested in our show of faith in God, and it is manifested in the things that God has provided us, his precious sheep. But people who don't know what it is to be in the presence of God often become afraid of the God that resides in us. And that fear is expressed outwardly as anger and as jealousy, inspiring gossip and persecution. So just know that if you spend a lot of time in the things of God, that's how some will react to you. So don't be surprised. I found it really interesting the contrast between Moses' attitude when he first set out on this journey and the attitude after he began spending time with God. And in this episode, we have seen the one who God sent actually getting closer to God. And we see the other remain the same, unchanged by even the presence of God or his power. While Moses submits himself to God Aaron continues in compromise and is more afraid of what the people say and think that he is of God and what he wants to do in them, through them. The irony in this text is that the one who was reluctant to do the will of God, Moses, was actually the one who grew closer to God, while the one who didn't resist at all is the one who remained the same. Well, I hope you got a lot out of part two of Even the Best of Us, a study in the book of Exodus. Make sure that you stick around for part three as we'll go deeper into their journey, not only with the people of Israel out in the wilderness, but their experiences with the one and only true and living God. So thank you so much for listening. Now, if you don't know Jesus in the pardoning of your sins and you want to, or you simply want to rededicate your life back to him, please say this simple prayer after me. Lord, I know that I am a sinner in need of your forgiveness and salvation. I believe that you sent your one and only son to Calvary to die on the cross for my sins. And because he was the only one who qualified 
to be that perfect sacrifice through and by his blood. He was killed, buried, and rose on the third day with all power, and in doing so, he paid my sin debt in full. So please forgive me of my sins and come into my heart. Live in me so that I will be yours and that you will be my God. Amen. So I believe that if you said that simple prayer and you were earnest about it, then I want to be the first to tell you, welcome to the family of faith. My first recommendation for you would be to connect yourself with people that love God. Ask God to send you to a ministry that rightly divides his word, a Bible-based ministry where you can grow in the things of God so that we can do God's will in serving him as well as people. So thank you so much for listening, watching Word on the Street with JP. If you dug what you heard and you want to hear more, make sure that you go to YouTube, find my YouTube channel, which is Rain Radio ATL. That's R E I G N. Radio Alpha Tango Lima, Rain Radio ATL. Please like, please subscribe, and please share so we all can do our part in spreading the gospel around the world. Make sure that you take care of yourselves, take care of one another, and God willing, until next time, we'll see you on the radio.